We can hear you. How are you? Thanks very much, uh, uh, dear Nando, for joining us. That's a great 
honor to have you with us uh, today. Thank you. Oh, thank you for the invitation. Good yeah, afternoon, no good morning, good evening. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Sarah must be with us as well. Uh, I found I was on. I couldn't actually unmute myself. Oh yeah, sorry for that. Sorry. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Those who just joined us today, and welcome to the third day of the conference. And also welcome back to those who have been with us with our first keynote speaker. Uh, our second keynote presenter is Professor Louis Nando Rukao from University of Melbourne, Australia. Professor Nando is a professor of uh, smart grids and power systems at the University of Melbourne, Australia, and also a, a part-time professor of a smart grids at the University of Manchester, UK. His expertise is uh, in network in integration of distributed energy resources and its extensive portfolio of industrial and academic projects have led to above 150 publications and more than 60 technical reports and two patents, one filed by Symmetrix LTD and one filed by the University of Melbourne. Professor Okawa is an IGPLEP as distinguished lecturer and is also an editorial board member of the I3PD Power and Energy magazine. Professor Okao is an I3PD senior member since 2012. He holds a bachelor's degree in mechanical and electrical engineering and also a research master's and a PhD in electrical power engineering, both from Municipia Soltera, Brazil. I would like to invite Professor Luis Nando Cao now for his interesting talk on smart meter driving approaches for PV rich low voltage network modeling, operation, and planning. Thank you very much. Thank you for the kind introduction, Sarah. I'm going to share my screen. Uh, could you guys please confirm you can see my screen? Yes, yes. thank you. Excellent. So, uh, well, thank you very much for the kind introduction and perhaps Aras, thank you for the invitation and to the organizing committee of the International Conference of uh, Smart Grids and Energy Systems 2020. So all of you uh, in Western Australia, good morning, all of you in other parts of the world, good uh, uh, afternoon, good evening as well. I'm uh, right now in Melbourne, <laughs> so it's afternoon here. In the last uh, 45 minutes, because I want to have some time for questions that you guys might have, I will give you a bit of a, a, a glimpse on what uh, smart meter data can be used for not just the typical forecast that we already, I guess I got tired already of seeing that the smart meter is for forecast. Of course, it's obviously for forecast. But what about other things uh, like modeling, actually? The networks can, can we can we use this data for for modeling or to help assist in the modeling? Can we use it for operational purposes? Can we use it for planning purposes? So what I try to put together here are uh, specifically three uh, research projects that we've been carrying out in the last uh, couple of years at the University of Melbourne, and uh, the idea is to give you uh, some some concepts and uh, some results as well of these uh, implementations and how, how can actually smart meter driven approaches can help the future of not just low voltage but distribution networks in general. So first I will give you a, a, just for everyone to be on the same page, a quick overview of uh, distributed resources and distribution networks, the impacts and challenges that we have. Then we will get into actually assessing those impacts and potential solutions and what are the challenges uh, behind uh, doing those quantifications, you know, how much voltages are going to go up, for instance, that's a typical question, you know, if you are thinking of solar photovoltaics, or how much voltages will go down if we're talking about electric vehicles. So voltages is a very, very important aspect because of the non-linearities of the uh, networks. Uh, thermal problems, yeah, th those are problems, but thermal problems are really uh, something that you can actually just uh, assessed by quantifying how much uh, demand you have and what is the rate of capacity of the asset. So it's relatively straightforward, even if you consider the losses or you don't consider them because they're not that big anyways. So voltages is really the, the big problem. And because of the nonlinearities, where we think of models, right? And uh, because we think of models, then we think of, oh, well, we need to, to have the, the corresponding topology, the connectivity, the phase connectivity, the corresponding impedances. Oh, such a tough, job that we have. 
Well, yes, it is tough and it is something that needs to be done, but I wanted to provide also some other perspective, such as what I call model-free voltage calculations. What if you don't need an electrical model to do this? Or along those lines, what about model-free estimation of hosting capacity? What if I can tell you that you can predict more or less how much photovoltaic you can have in a given network without modeling the network? So this is what we're going to discuss today. Hope you enjoy. Let's just start. So what is the context for all these as in uh, distributed energy resources? What is actually happening around the world? Well, the thing is that in the last uh, year or two, what we have seen is uh, values of, uh, well, in the last two years, we have seen the final values that have happened across a year, across 10 years. But they are, uh, in the last 10 years, what we actually have seen uh, the, the cost of photovoltaics and batteries dropping you know, by almost 90%. In terms of wind turbines, we're looking at 50% in the last 10 years. So the, the, the cost today uh, in 2020 or even 2019, not significant changes have happened, uh, have, are very, very, very low compared to 10 years ago. And this, of course, has promoted the adoption of distributed energy resources, uh, not just in developed nations, but also in developing nations. Now, in particular in Australia, uh, considering that we have a system that well, we call the national electricity market, but that's really just the, the Eastern part where the major cities are, uh, well, the largest population, if you want, uh, we have around 38 gigawatts. Uh, but however, when it comes to distributed energy resources, or particularly solar photovoltaics, uh, we are, have around 13 gigawatts and, and increasing. And this, in terms of installation, we're talking about more than 2 million installations. So, which means we don't have 2 million we, uh, solar farms, uh, what we have is many, many houses, actually, many small installations. And uh, today is around one in two in five houses with solar photovoltaics. Actually, depending on the area, this number is actually even higher. Now, this has also encouraged people to start buying batteries to make the most of this uh, solar generation that is for free. And instead of uh, feeding it back to the grid when they are not at home during a weekday, for instance, where the only uh, load that you have is your refrigerator. Uh, well, you use the battery to store all that electricity and then use it at night and then therefore reduce your electricity imports and reduce your electricity bill. Actually, by the end of 2019, it was estimated that a third of the global market of residential batteries uh, was captured by Australia. So it's quite a big deal, actually. Now, it's not just Australia. Uh, we have uh, different countries, developed nations and developing nations as well. Now, the big thing here is that the more distributed energy resources that we have, the more new power flows we're going to have, bidirectional and different as well in terms of magnitude. Uh, so it means that we need, therefore, to understand and assess the corresponding impacts. And of course, the moment that we have impact, we need to assess the corresponding solutions as well. That requires quantification, OK? All right, but before we get into those details of the quantification, so what network impacts I'm talking about? So let's start with the basics. So we're all on the same page. Uh, so when we look at the low voltage network, so this is, for instance, in the case of Australia, the 400 volt line to line or for just a single phase house, 230 volts line to neutral. We designed these circuits uh, for what we call the after diversity maximum demand, which is actually the average peak demand of the houses. And then we designed it for that moment in time, uh, which is not in time exactly, but it's just average peak. Um, then we just uh, assess that, you know, for the corresponding design principles of a given region, you know, uh, LV feeder is no longer than 600 meters, let's say. You make your calculations, uh, and then you say, well, the cross section of this particular feeder is this size, and then the size of the transformer is this size for this number of houses. And with this, I will ensure that the voltages will never go below the statutory limits during that peak, and that my assets are all okay. We have done this uh, across the world for decades. There's nothing wrong with that. The problem is that that was for demand, a demand that uh, has a lot of diversity. The moment that we install photovoltaics, the sun shines to everyone simultaneously. So the diversity is extremely low or quite the opposite. The coincidence is very high. So the moment that you have photovoltaics, again, you know, during a weekday, no one at home, and uh, the only loads that you have are your refrigerator. So these photovoltaics 
are going to uh, inject power back to the grid and they will create what we call reverse power flows. Why reverse? Because it's going the other way, you know, that it's not necessarily following the load, it's going the other way around. Um, now, there's nothing wrong with that per se. The problem is that if we have a lot of reverse power flows, what we're going to have because of the physics of these particular networks, uh, we're going to increase the voltages as a result. And of course, the currents, the aggregated currents of all these reverse power flows can actually exceed the thermal capacity of the corresponding assets, the conductors, the transformers. So, more adoption of photovoltaics or distributed energy sources, more problems. Now, and the problems are not limited to just those low voltage networks. It happens in the middle voltage as well, because the moment they have multiple areas uh, with these technologies, well, the same problem will happen, that's it. So for sure, you don't have a single uh, medium voltage feeder anywhere in the world that is just houses. It's very rare uh, because you will have schools, you will have shops, you will have other type of uh, customers. But still, uh, it highlights the fact that the more we have photovoltaics, particularly rooftops or solar photovoltaics, the more we're going to have this particular situation. And actually, as a matter of fact, many countries around the world, not just Australia, we are already having companies reporting reverse power flows at their prim primary substations. So really, all the corresponding generation going up to even the sub-transmission networks or transmission networks. Now, given that we are going to have the challenges and we already have them, then the big question is how can we assess those problems in advance for operational or planning purposes? Now, why in advance? Because the idea here is to assess what might happen. What might happen in the next five minutes? What might happen in the next hour? What might happen tomorrow? Or what might happen in five years or in six months? So there's an operational component to that and then there's a planning component to that. So that's why we need to do this in advance. Uh, you can argue, well, it's like doing what if scenarios. You know, If this happens, can I calculate what would be the result? So to estimate what to do as well. So that's the idea here. And depending on what we're looking at is for operation or for planning purposes. But that's a big question. How can we assess them? How can we quantify them? So there are impacts and solutions that need to be assessed, right? The thing is that uh, when we look at assessing these impacts and these solutions, we need to understand what is happening here. What are the challenges? So voltage is for, uh, uh, to start with, is a locational effect, all right? So you would require, naturally, if you want to calculate uh, what's happening with the voltages, the network models and the impedances. Now, distributed data resources in the context of what I was uh, presenting in the, my, my, my few slides there were residential distributed energy resources. So the LV network models are extremely important, not just having the medium voltage and then dismissing what is happening in the low voltage by just using aggregated uh, loads, for instance. We need to capture the physics of what is happening there next to the end customers. Now, of course, the physics also mean that we need to understand what is uh, what are the effects of unbalance. I mean, I guess that we understand what are the effects of unbalance, but what I try to say is that we need to capture those unbalances, uh, the, the effects among the phases, and then therefore we need three-phase models. Um, we need to also understand the fact that demand and generation need to be observable need to be understood because if we're going to calculate what is happening in terms of voltages in a given point, we need to know what is happening in terms of demand, P and Q uh, generation, whatever, in other different points of the same network. So that means we require a lot of data. And of course, the networks are not just wires and transformers, they are also controllable assets, uh, capacitor banks, on load the changers, and all of these adds more complexity. So capturing the physics of networks, and in particular low voltage networks, because as I will explain in the next slides, we don't have much of them, um, the models, uh, is key. However, as I'm saying here as well in this particular slide, in practice, distribution companies do not have adequate low voltage models, and that is a big challenge. So uh, when we look at most distribution companies around the world, uh, really, those electrical models do not exist. They don't have them, all right? Uh, many will have what we call geographical information systems. So everything, you know, in like mapping systems, uh, even with topology aspects, you know, called coordinates, but that's not enough. That's not to run a power flow. That's simply for asset management purposes, just to know where things are and what sort of assets you have. But that doesn't mean that you have actually the impedances there. And if we're looking at a three-phase conductor, you have a matrix, all right? That at the very least is three by three because of each of the phases. So they don't have that in GIS because it's not for electrical purposes, it's just to, for asset management. 
Even those networks uh, or these network companies that have some data, sometimes it's incomplete or non-validated. They have it, but they are not entirely sure where that is correct. And this really is regarding connectivity, uh, impedances, and many other aspects. And this is very, very challenging, all right? Before there was no need of knowing all this because we were not modeling the low voltage power because it was not needed. All right, we could just design it for the worst case scenarios I was explaining earlier, and then that's it, forget about it. You don't need more. But now that we need to know more about the voltages at the connection point of the customers, the more we need to model these corresponding networks. Now, the, fortunately, little by little, uh, this is changing, all right, in terms of how, how they are trying to model the networks because the smart meters. Thanks to smart meters and the need that these citizen resources are creating, you know, in terms of understanding what is happening here in these particular networks, things are changing. So particularly in Victoria, for instance, uh, we have a full deployment of the smart meters uh, of all the companies. So we're talking about Osnet Services, uh, Gemini, United Energy, Power Core, and City Power. They all have smart meters and they manage the smart meters. And with that data uh, of the smart meters, of course, they have uh, for each of the houses, uh, well, P, Q, and V. Or in reality, it's not P and Q, you have the current and the power factor. And then therefore, of course, you can calculate P and Q, right? Uh, but just let's, for simplicity, let's call it P, Q, and V. Uh, all of that, the magnitudes. And normally uh, every 30 minutes, but uh, well, things are changing for them to have it recorded as well as five minutes. In, ge in general, these devices can actually record every second if you want. It depends on how you want to manage your data. But the point is the information is available. Now, because of this information, depending on the company, how they've been exploiting this data, they already know more about the feeder topology, uh, to some extent, the impedances, sometimes it's not because of the parameter data, it's just because they have been putting together all the information that they have about the design of these networks. They also know how many customers you have per transformer, how many customers per feeder, and in those cases, really it's because of the use of the data. Uh, it is, in some cases, very difficult for them to uh, understand which phase group uh, each house is, all right? So you have three phases, so three phase groups. Uh, some companies do have uh, algorithms to use smart meter data for those purposes, which is great. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we actually know the actual phase. Knowing that you have three groups is different from knowing which phase it is, because that will depend on the connections of your transformer and the connections of that transformer with respect to the medium voltage network, all right? So um, it, it is not that simple, but it is a lot of progress. Something that is challenging though, is still even uh, in Victoria and other uh, countries that uh, other, other places in the world that they have uh, or are starting to exploit smart meter data is the service cable. So knowing exactly uh, the impedance of the service cable is difficult because they haven't uh, necessarily recorded the exact position of the meter. So if you don't have the exact position of the meter, you might have the exact position of the pole to which the service cable is connected to, but not the actual meter within the land uh, uh, owned by the corresponding house. So that of course creates a difference and then that perhaps might not be recorded properly. So there are still challenges, all right? But eventually, you know, what we want, if we really look at a model-based approach, what you want is, you know, to be able to calculate the, the, the voltages based on the demand, the certain resources, so PQ, uh, and impedances, and the three-phase modeling, all right? And the more data that you have, the better electrical models you can actually produce, and the more accurate voltage calculations. So that's the principle, correct? So exploiting smart meter data can unlock many opportunities for operation and planning, and that's the, the, the whole point of this presentation here. So let's start with one of these uh, three projects that I wanted to present to you. So this, this first one is what I call the model-based impedance estimation and voltage calculations. This was uh, done uh, by uh, Yolanda, uh, one Enfield student at the university, and that, that's the paper that was accepted recently, and we're working on other papers as well. So let me show you what was done here. And of course, I will try to, because of the time, and we only have uh, 30 more minutes, I will try to go relatively quick with the main concepts. So the idea here is, uh, well, I mean, uh, we can understand, or many companies, at least in Victoria, already understand what are the connectivity uh, of the houses in terms of the phase group, uh, in terms of the feeder that they have, et cetera, et cetera. So that is understood. However, if speed, impedance are still a challenge, either because they are not validated or they are just not known. So this project was really to understand that, but not just focusing on the impedance, because at the end of the day, why do you want the impedance? All right, just to know. No, you want impedances because you want a complete model so you can do the voltage calculations. So the end product really was the voltage calculations, but part of that was impedances. So we started with that. 
So if uh, we do not know the impedances, uh, for instance, this three by three here that I'm presenting in this little graph, then how can we know what will be the effect of an injection from a house with, you know, with five kilowatts? So we need, we need the impedances to then do this calculation if we're going to use the electrical models, right? So the idea here in this methodology was to first use uh, a technique using uh, smart meter data uh, to estimate these impedances, all right? So in this case, what we need is head of the feeder uh, metering. So the aggregated PQ and the voltage magnet as well per phase uh, at the head of the feeder. This is not a normal measurement that you have uh, across the world. So this is something that still we're working on how to do this without this information, but in this case, it is with that information. And also the, the, the smart meter data. Uh, we uh, created linearized voltage drop equations, but that captured the three phase uh, interactions. And we apply what it is called multiple linear regression. And with that, we can actually calculate the, the estimated impedances. I will explain a little bit more about this multiple linear regression in the next slide. And once you have the impedances, of course, you have the model. You can even apply as well your linearized voltage equations. So you don't need power flows, good iterative process. So you have even a much faster calculation that is accurate. And then you can actually answer the question, what is the voltage for a given injection or absorption of power, All right? So let's go into the impedance estimation. What is the basic concept behind this? So the basic concept is, well, let's suppose that you have a conductor, all right? That's our red line here. And uh, you have smart meter data. Smart meter data that you have uh, in both points, all right? So you have on the sending end, you have uh, not necessarily smart meter data, but you have data. Let's suppose you, you head of the theater, that's your starting point. So you have the P, the Q, and the voltage magnitude in one point, and the P and Q in the other uh, side. So with that little line there, the red line, you can say, oh, well, this is like a voltage drop. Now that's very simple. So I can say, well, uh, do my voltage drop calculation very simply because it's just one phase. And then, well, uh, this is what I have, multiple equations, but my R and X are unknown. All right. So, but what, it are, what are known are the voltage magnitudes, P and Q for each of the instances. So it means I have a, a, a set of equations for each of the time steps of my smart meter data, where the only unknowns are R and X for this particular uh, case, but the rest is known. It's just that it's changing in time because it's the historical data that is just recording what happened at those moments. So it means that I can apply a multiple linear regression model because I have so many knowns that I can actually extract what would be the best uh, values for this unknowns that are repeated because they are fixed. The impedance is not changing in time. So therefore, I can estimate that. So that's the, the concept that, well, if you understood this, it's pretty simple, isn't it? Well, the reality is it's slightly more complex, not because of the multiple linear regression, but because of the fact that we have three phases. So therefore, you need to actually consider uh, equations that are a little bit more uh, awkward if you want, uh, but not necessarily that that complex. Uh, they just need to involve, of course, angles that we don't have. So we need to assume certain angles from the head of the feeder and then downstream the corresponding feeder that we're looking at. But once we have this, we can apply again the multiple linear regression because we have many parameters that are known, that are being repeated because of the data that we are using, the historical data. What it is unknown will be uh, the corresponding resistances and reactances. In particular, if you're looking at a three-phase uh, piece of conductor, then you will have the corresponding mutual and self uh, uh, impedances and reactances. So you will need to calculate all that. Uh, of course, the moment that we use these values, these are values that they can be also used for the corresponding uh, different phases. And that's in general the concept. So the moment that you have the corresponding feeder, how do you apply this? Well, the idea is that you go step by step. So you start at the head of the feeder with some measurements. And uh, with these measurements that you have of voltage at the head of the feeder, the first house, let's suppose that this house is connected there. You see the red line there. So you have the voltage and the P and Q for this particular house at a given moment in time. You can calculate the corresponding current. And then with this current and this voltage, you can apply the multi, uh, multiple linear regression for the corresponding uh, conductor here. Once you have this for this conductor, because it's the same conductor just for other phases, you can use the corresponding self impedance and mutual impedances that you are calculating for one. And then, well, you just continue, and then, well, you calculate the voltage, you calculate the voltage in bus one based on what you just calculated, and then you can go on and go on and continue with this. Now, this, uh, 
of course, becomes slightly more complex than when you have laterals, but uh, it is the same thing. So this can actually be done. So once you have the impedances estimated, well, the next step is the voltage calculations. So because you have already the corresponding linearized model for the voltage calculation, you have the corresponding data. So you just need, you know, what is your demand or the uh, scenario that you want, like for instance, having photovoltaics. And that's it. Really relatively simple, as I am explaining, it's not that simple, you need to read the paper. So let me show you some, some results here. So this is a, a realistic uh, LB area, residential area. Uh, we just captured one of the multiple uh, feeders that exist in this area. This is totally anonymized, so you cannot read exactly what is there. And uh, this particular feeder has 31 single phase residential customers. It's around 300 meters and service scales around 10 meters. So this is the model in kind of in a simplistic way. And this is uh, this was uh, modeling was done with uh, the help in collaboration of OSNET services. Now, um, for the corresponding smart meter data, the reality is that because this particular uh, realistic LV, LV, LV feeder uh, was planned, but was was not existing. So there was no smart meter data for that. So what we used was a pool of actual smart meter data, but just P and Q values of uh, anonymized data for residential customers that were similar to that area. Uh, and this data was 30 minute averages. Because we didn't have voltages, we needed to run the corresponding power flows uh, for the corresponding network that we have fully modeled so as to test our ideas. Now, there are two ways of doing this. One is what we call the realistic way. So we needed to create five minute resolution, P and Q values, run the corresponding power flows for every five minutes and then extract the 30 minute average. Why? Because smart meters take the average. The simple way is of course, just running power flows for each of the 30 minute values here. Now, of course, the more accurate one will be the realistic one, but still both are power flows in a way. Nonetheless, we did it for both just to, to understand what will be the implications. And this is here plotted the data that I'm showing and the corresponding voltage drops that you're gonna see when you don't have any generation in this case. Now, uh, in this uh, slide, now I'm presenting the percentage error, okay, of the resistances uh, and reactances, so mutual and, and self for if the different segments that we have. Uh, in general, the results are pretty good. Although you might argue, well, uh, Nando, you have some 200% of error here. <laughs> and in some cases, uh, really well, like 400% error. What is that? That's not good. <laughs> and that's true, actually, uh, for those segments, uh, the error is significant. However, the thing is that the reactance is not necessarily that important in the, at the moment of the voltage calculations, and you are going to see the results of the voltage calculations in the next slide. And also, although this is a segment, it doesn't mean that it's a segment that has many meters. So therefore, the corresponding impact on the calculation of voltages is much, much smaller than bigger segments that are you know, in other parts. So, so you, you, uh, understanding the distance of, of each of these elements as well is also important, you know, uh, as how much they are going to affect the corresponding voltage calculations. So despite the fact that some errors seem very big, they are not that big for the ultimate purpose, which is voltage calculation. One interesting thing to say here is that the realistic data is actually much more accurate. So the real data from these parameters will, will give very good results. But in general, the estimations were pretty good for impedances. Now, the important thing is the voltages. So what we have here now is going to be, we're going to do a test with the same P and Q values of demand, but now we are going to put 100% of photo, solar photovoltaics and try to, to assess where our voltage calculation, our what if scenario with solar photovoltaics would actually work. Uh, these results uh, present the voltage mismatch in volts. This is not percentage, this is in volts. So, Remember uh, the voltages that we're meant to see around, are around 230 volts, but in reality, because of the photovoltaic penetration, they might go up, but certainly it shouldn't go way beyond 253, which is the limit. Now, here is not about assessing the limit, it's about assessing the mismatch. So the real sort of simulation, the complete simulation, and the estimated impedances. And what we see here with the impedances that have been estimated using realistic data, we have a mismatch that doesn't go beyond 0 0.3 volts. This is extremely accurate. Even if we use a simplified approach, you know, for, for the voltage calculation that we did, uh, for the data, the hybrid parameter data, it still is pretty good. So in general, excellent accuracy for voltage calculation. So it is possible to achieve this. So key remarks for this part of the presentation. Uh, the accuracy of the impedance estimation is overall good, but the most important thing is that the accuracy of the calculated voltages is very high. So this can be a very effective tool for distribution companies to calculate customer voltages uh, in 
for any what if uh, sort of scenario. Of course, very important here, and it's a, it's a big limitation if you want, is that the head of the LV feeder measurements are needed. And this means cost and other implications as well, training people, gathering the data, et cetera, integrating this into your smart meter systems, like the, the, the gathering of the information, et cetera, et cetera. That is not simple, of course, but it is possible. All right, let's move on to another aspect of this uh, presentation. Now, we are moving from model-based to model-free. Now, when I re refer to model-free, it's the electrical model, but the model has to be created somehow. <laughs> this is what I'm gonna discuss very, very briefly. This is a, a part of the, the PhD work of Vincenzo Bassi, as well in collaboration with Professor Tansu Alpang at the University of Melbourne. Now, we, we just submitted a power tech paper for this, uh, so fingers crossed. <laughs> and because of this, uh, at the same time, I cannot present a lot of the corresponding uh, work inside. So I'm gonna present you the, the concept and some of the results, but unfortunately, I cannot present the details of the methodology. Uh, so apologies for that. What is the concept here? Or what is the challenge if you want? So the challenge is, can we get rid of electrical models? Do we really need them? So, I mean, I'm, I'm an electrical engineer, for, I'm an electromechanical engineer for many years, and I've been working in the modeling of these regional areas for over, well, uh, 20 years already. <laughs> and uh, yes, I would say yes, all the time. And there is still, of course, always applications for that. But are there any opportunity where we can get rid of electrical models? particularly to calculate voltages. So that's the whole point here. So we have smart meter data as I was explaining earlier, correct? So what if we can move from this voltage calculation that requires demand, you know, P and Q values, the impedances, the three-phase modeling, and we just simply calculate voltages based on the P and Q values of the houses. Can we do this? Is it possible? Well, let me tell you, it is actually, as a matter of fact. So what we are employing here is deep neural networks, all right? So the idea here is to capture the physics of the LV networks, all right? So I'm not gonna go into the details of how a deep neural network works, uh, or a neural network for, for it matters, a deep neural network is just with more hidden layers. Um, it's really about trying to capture first uh, inputs and outputs. So in terms of historical data, what we would like is to relate the voltages that we're gonna see at the customer connection points with the corresponding demand P and Q values that we are seeing in, in, in the historical data. And the neural network, what it's gonna do is gonna actually with a given structure that has to be refined, of course, with a lot of work, um, it requires a lot of training, et cetera, will actually have a structure that will capture also the non-linearities and all the relationships among the customers for the different demand generation situations to then actually mimic almost the, the relationship that ends up being the voltages at the customer connection point. So the idea really is just to produce another nonlinear function, all right? Uh, based on the fact that we don't have anything about the low voltage networks or very little, and, uh, but we have smart meter data. And we do this from the input variables and the output variables. So that's in, in terms of the training and extracting that relationship. And once you have that relationship, then similar to what I was presenting in the previous project, once you have the corresponding impedance, then we just calculate the corresponding simplified power flows. Uh, in this case, once you have the corresponding neural network model, then you can actually do whatever you want with your inputs to calculate the corresponding outputs, which are the voltages. That's the idea. In this equation here, the W really represents all the corresponding weights and biases that represent the neural network. But as I said, I'm not gonna go into the details of this precisely. Uh, the main thing is that we require first a training process, all right? A training process by which historical data has to go into the neural network part as inputs, part as outputs, in this case, the voltage, because we're interested about voltages. And this training, of course, will capture the underlying nonlinear relationships of these single phase smart meter uh, data for a given low voltage feeder. Can this be done for a whole uh, high voltage network, medium voltage network? Uh, well, that's a question. <laughs> Can it be done for multiple feeders simultaneously? Well, that's a question. We, what we're doing here is just per LV feeder, all right? which can be dozens uh, of, of customers easily anyways. Once you train this neural network, once you capture the corresponding parameters that really make the calculation of voltages almost possible or very, very, very accurately, then you can actually use it for this voltage calculation for any scenario of demand, any, any P and Q values, because you will get the relationships. That's the idea. And then without any power flows, without even knowing 
which face group the customers are connected to without even knowing where the customers are. You just need to know the exact customers, the exact data for the feeder that you are interested. The rest, the neural network will do. So let me, as I said, I'm not going to show you the, how we get into the actual model and the hyperparameters and the parameters that's uh, in the paper and uh, well, right now has been submitted. So I cannot disclose that information. Uh, you will need to trust me, unfortunately, but let me uh, give you a few results here. So this is a feeder uh, with 31 customers. Um, we have um, 10 customers in one phase, 10 customers in another phase, 11 customers in another phase. Uh, of course, we have 31 uh, service cables. And uh, well, this is a three feeder, two phase uh, feeder, uh, two phase conductor, but then we have the single phase connections. All right. Uh, so, what we're going to do first is to train uh, the neural network with data that does not consider photovoltaics, that it's just demand. Okay. So, and we're going to use our uh, pool of anonymized smart meter data. We're going to put it there. Of course, we need to run power flows to create the corresponding voltage values, similar to what I was presenting uh, in, in the previous project. But then we are going to test whatever we're going to find uh, our trained uh, neural network. Uh, we're going to test it with 100% penetration. So really, really different data. Uh, some people that really are into neural networks will tell me, Nando, how can you do this? I mean, you shouldn't actually make such a, such a jump. Well, the idea of the jump here was simply to test how far we can go with this neural network. And actually, the results are pretty impressive. In reality, you cannot have trained data from a network with 0% penetration, and then you're going to use it for 100%. I mean, people will not in one week put suddenly photovoltaics, right? So your trained data will actually be the evolution of the penetrations if it is many months, or just simply, for instance, if you start today and your, your uh, 10 out of your 30 houses have photovoltaics, is the data that I did. So your training will use the data. So what we did here was particularly just to see how much we can stretch the particular neural network. In reality, you will have the data that is available and it might already capture the photovoltaic systems. Now, uh, all here on the left, we have the training data set that it is just a, well, active power, reactive power, and the corresponding voltage for those cases. So this is just normal demand, okay? Um, here we have the data. This is just for one of the customers, of course. The test data uh, will be with photovoltaics. So what you're seeing here is the injections, the negative uh, uh, P values. What we see here is the voltages that are raising, of course, you know, because uh, that's what you end up having, you know, with uh, voltage problems with photovoltaics. And here is just to plot, you know, what is the difference between the train and the test data. Now. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm not going to show all the results uh, that are related to the actual hyperparameters and parameters, but just to say that, of course, we needed to go through a training process to determine what is the best number of hidden layers, activation functions, neurons, epochs, et cetera, and then the weights and biases as well. And uh, the corresponding model uh, will be extracted from that. So that part I cannot present, unfortunately, because the paper is still under review. However, I can present the results. And the results here now are, uh, showing for 100% penetration, once the neural network has been completed, uh, the corresponding, uh, what we call the actual voltage values from the test. So this is really running a, a power flow, proper power flow, and the model-free voltage calculation. This is using the neural network. And what you can see here is that they are pretty close, pretty, pretty close, without having a low voltage feeder model, an electrical model, that is. So the accuracy is very high, which is extremely encouraging. And if we see it a little bit deeper in terms of the numbers, not just graphically, what we see is the, uh, the mean square error uh, during the test is really below one volt, actually quite tiny. We're looking at, uh, in all cases, it's less than uh, 0.01, uh, 0.02 volts. And uh, our maximum deviation uh, is less than one volt. And if you look to solar hours, which is in this case, because of photovoltaics, the, the critical ones, let's say, well, we're still looking, you know, uh, an MSC, you know, that has a value of 0 0.02 volts and a maximum deviation of less than one volt. So quite impressive um, results uh, in my modest opinion um, uh, for using this particular technique. So quite accurate results, you would say. So key remarks from this uh, particular part of the presentation, uh, really accurate model-free voltage calculations can be performed actually, if we have the corresponding smart meter data. And this is ready for what if scenarios that can be used for both operation purposes. So to determine what to do in the next five minutes, next 10 minutes, next uh, whatever it is, uh, if you have the data, of course, 
and uh, also for planning purposes, because you can uh, now know with your what if scenarios, uh, what happens if people have now electric vehicles, or if they install whatever other technology. And all of this without electrical models, all right? Now, of course, the hyperparameters and parameters, they need to be determined based on train, and this is not a simple process, but what, what we uh, are, uh, are envisaging is that there's an opportunity, this is our first attempt, uh, quite, quite, um, optimistic about the results, but still, you know, there might be an opportunity for generalization of the structure, hyperparameters, et cetera, et cetera. And that would be really uh, extraordinary if, if similar approaches are to be used in the future by distribution companies. Now, to finalize uh, here the presentation, this is a model-free, another model-free estimation of DER hosting capacity. This was work done by uh, Dr. Andreas Procopio, a past research fellow, and uh, this is part of the Advanced Planning of Peverage Institution Networks project funded by ARENA and OSNET Services. This is in particular task two, which is innovative analytical techniques. Um, there's a paper there, and there's also webinars and a report available publicly. Now, the question here is, you know, can we quickly assess the hosting capacity of a given network just using smart meter data? So then you will have many questions. How do you relate time series smart meter data to hosting capacity? Which parameters do you use? Is it current, the voltage, P and Q? How much data you need? So all of these are very important questions. And how do you deal with them? Uh, well, I mean, you need to do many tests, that's it. <laughs> so we started first with actual smart meter data for a quite big network, more than 3,000 customers. But uh, as much as we got a lot of data, you know, for one day for all the customers, the reality is that uh, we realized that extracting this data for uh, many, many months was not going to be possible because of the corresponding significant uh, time that would require from OSNET to do these uh, privacy issues and many things. So at the end, uh, we decided to go for uh, an approach where we were using hybrid data still with the corresponding network models, but then similar to what I was presenting before in terms of the hybrid smart meter data. So we were using a, uh, an actual realistic pool of uh, smart meter data with P and Q values but we were producing our own voltages by running power flows in the actual network. So we ended up with more than 1 billion data points uh, to do this across a five year time horizon to, to see the evolution of daily photovoltaic uh, installations, all right? Uh, well, not every day there, were, uh, there was a new installation, but you know, in five years it was from 0% of installations to 100% installations. So all houses with photovoltaic. So we were running all these to create the hybrid smart meter data to then see where we can extract any relationships. And indeed, actually, the first thing that we did was a Pearson uh, correlation heat map. And what we found is that the best correlation uh, is with active power and uh, the maximum voltages. So this is what you can see is here in the left. Perhaps pretty obvious the moment that you see the results, but it's good to do this Pearson correlation heat map anyways. And then, of course, that means that you know we need to capture the maximum delay voltages uh, for each of the uh, simulations that we have and uh, relate this to the aggregated active power. So that was the, the actual uh, correlation. It's not that just the active power of the house, it's the aggregated power for that corresponding uh, low voltage transformer, the distribution transformer. So we found this correlation and then we started to dig a little bit farther. And then what we decided to do was to create a regression model. So let me explain what is actually happening here. So this aggregated uh, power at the, at the distribution transformer, then we divide it by the number of customers that the transformer was supplying, and then we get what it is called a diversified imports or exports value, okay, in kilowatts. We related this to the maximum value that we found as well uh, for each of these uh, instances. Uh, this was run every, um, how many, every minutes, I think? Uh, I don't remember. I think it was every 30 minutes, uh, I guess, yes, every 30 minutes. And then uh, that means that uh, we, we needed to process uh, for each of the days, you know, all these 48 points, we extracted the, the, large, uh, the largest voltage. And for that moment in time, we extract as well the aggregated active power and we divide it by the number of customers. And this gives you a point, all right, for each of the days. So the idea is that with these points in time, they will be evolving and we can create a regression model that can tell us, well, the moment that you get to diversify import or export of certain value, you might get to the maximum voltage. So, and that maximum voltage will determine your hosting capacity. So right now here in Australia, if you go to uh, 253 volts line to neutral uh, for a single phase customer, 
uh, that's the, the maximum limit that uh, things should go. In reality, sometimes it's a little bit higher, but uh, the idea is that the network uh, operators, uh, the, the companies that manage the poles and wires, they ensure that our voltages are not uh, above 253 volts. In per unit, that means 1.1. So the idea is that you do not go beyond 1.1. So of course, the moment that you have just a few da data points, that regression would be kind of rubbish. <laughs> but if you have many points, that regression becomes more and more accurate. So we did this analysis with all the data that we have for different penetrations, and we uh, got some interesting results. So we did this for, the report is publicly available. There's a, a webinar as well just on this, uh, if you want to um, uh, find more information about it. And uh, well, I'm just gonna present some of the results very quickly because we're finalizing in a few minutes. So we did uh, all these analysis for one of uh, the multiple uh, high-V feeders that we analyzed. Uh, these are high-V feeders, 22 kV, where we also model the low voltage networks as pseudo models, so not the exact models, but pseudo models are pretty realistic. And uh, let me present you some of the results. So for this particular network, uh, CI21, we're picking one of the distribution transformers, one LV network of the almost 80 that we have here in this particular high voltage network. And what we're seeing is that at 10 to 20% penetration, so 10 to 20% of the house with photovoltaics, we, these are all the points that we're extracting for this particular uh, transformer. So these are all the uh, maximum voltages and the corresponding diversified import exports. With all these points, you know, uh, after approximately, I don't know, more or less, I don't know, nine months, uh, more or less, so because all of this is five uh, years, I believe. So let's say nine months. Um, what we have is a, a, a regression that tells us that the 1.1 will be found at approximately, well, I don't know, 2. Point, I don't know, 8, yeah, 2.8 uh, kilowatts of diversified. So if everyone injects 2.8, then uh, then you are going to reach the 253 volts. So the maximum, the housing capacity would be in terms of voltages. Uh, now, in reality, that's not the, the real value. The real value is a little bit less, right? As I'm showing here for the highest penetrations, but it is how we are estimating. So it can estimate, actually, these values are telling us that it can estimate. So if you have a little bit more, you know, 20 to 30% penetration data, so the past data, then your, uh, your accuracy gets better. So now it's 3.19, then it's 2.69. So this is changing because of the data that you're extracting, you know? And of course, at some point you really hit the limit, all right, <laughs> uh, officially, but... Uh, and then the values, of course, is around 2.45, you know. But the idea is that uh, these simulations are showing us that with relatively low uh, penetrations and the corresponding data following the method that we're proposing, you can actually estimate more or less what would be the total injections that would create the hosting capacity uh, limit. Now, of course, you say, Nando, but 2.8 kilowatts, that doesn't tell me, you know, how much photovoltaics I should install. Yes, it does tell you because this is diversified. So the 2.8, then you multiply by the corresponding number of customers that you have in that uh, particular area. And then that gives you a total installation value. And then uh, you remove whatever it is already installed. And then that the, the reminder is corresponding to the new installation. So that's how you actually can say, well, up to this number of installations, in terms of capacity, uh, I can accept in this particular area. More than that, we create problems and then therefore I need to upgrade or do something else. So actually, it means that just using a smart meter data in a way as we are proposing it, it is possible to extract real value for hosting capacity. Now we did this for the 80, well, say 71 low voltage networks. Um, for 80% of them, actually the results were pretty, pretty good, which is very, very encouraging. So just to finalize, there's a few remarks here for this particular uh, project. Um, actually, they, they were very meaningful uh, hosting capacity estimations, particularly uh, at low penetrations. It is possible to achieve that. But this is particularly for the urban and rural networks when we look at a random attack, right? So when installations are all over the place. Uh, also, end to head, which means, you know, assuming that the installations are going to start closer to the zones of the station or the transformers. Uh, and for rural as well, was working. But the moment that the installations start working at the very end of the feeders, for whatever reason, then this is where the, the accuracy really goes a little bit busted. Uh, so it's not perfect for sure. But in general, a great alternative for very quick uh, hosting capacity assessments of DR, in this particular case, solar photovoltaics. There's a link here for the corresponding uh, uh, YouTube video, and well, there's more link for the corresponding deliveries. Well, I'm on my time. So just to finish, 
uh, I just want to say that, well, the future of distribution is super exciting. Uh, the adoption of distributed resources is happening. People and businesses are installing distributed resources. Uh, in different paces and different places around the world, but still, it's, it's very encouraging. We want to uh, lower our emissions. We want to be more self-sufficient. That's all great. Uh, but of course, the network challenges are becoming much more evident everywhere. Okay, reverse power flows are happening, and well, reverse power flow is not a problem. The moment that these are quite big, that's, that's a problem. So we need clever ways of assessing the potential problems in advance, right? So for operational and planning purposes, and of course, the lack of LV uh, models are a bit of a barrier. All right, uh, smart meters. Well, they are being deployed by companies around the world. It is going to continue. It might take some more time in certain places where things are more expensive, but this is just something that will happen everywhere in the world for sure. Uh, of course, companies are exploiting the more obvious low-hanging fruits. So for instance, you know, face groups or uh, understanding, you know, how many customers you have in, in each LV feeder, verification of that. And that's great that they are doing this, but there are many opportunities, you know, as I was mentioning, well, the impedances, voltage calculations to, uh, uh, to, to do, as well as hosting capacity. Interestingly, as I was presenting in this uh, uh, keynote is that uh, smart meters can potentially enable model-free approaches that can, I believe, revolutionize how we operate and plan our networks. Of course, that's not to say that electrical models are not needed. They are needed for sure, but we can have other approaches that can help us dealing with this. Well, just to finalize, there's uh, well plenty of information on my website and also in the Resource Center of PS and Smart Grid. And just to acknowledge the University of Melbourne, the University of Manchester, Austin Services, Arena, as well as Yolanda, Vincenzo, Tansu, and Andreas for their contributions to this presentation. Thank you very much and ready for questions. Well, thank you. Thank you, Professor Fernando, for your interesting uh, presentation. Um, informative and um, very interesting. Now the panel is open for questions and answers. Um, I think microphones are not on mute, so if you want to ask questions, you're welcome. And also the chat uh, session is open. Questions. Um, I have one question myself uh, about the smart meters. You uh, mentioned about the um, this um, model-free. Um, that are uh, everybody is just looking forward to. No, not I'm not quite sure about this. Actually, you said um, uh, the transition is going towards uh, having um, model-free electric uh, systems. So, how do you see um, the future? Uh, do you think um, the companies are going towards this uh, model-free systems uh, while we have this smart grid, smart meters? or um, I don't know really. Uh, well, I mean, thanks th for the questions. Sarah. Uh, as I said here in my conclusions, of course, we still need electrical models for many other things. So no way we can get rid of the electrical models. No way, all right? We need them. We need them to do much more accurate things and to always validate certain things. That doesn't mean that we cannot have model-free approaches for certain things, all right? So we can live uh, with different uh, techniques to do different things, as companies do every, every day. They have different platforms for managing their data, for managing other type of data, for managing the assets, for managing data, for managing operations. They use a software tool for operation, a software tool for planning. They are doing this all the time. It's the same thing as, as we do when we manage you know, Zoom, or is it Teams, or is it a WebEx? Same thing. They are using whatever it is needed when it is needed. So I'm not advocating for model-free approaches. What I see is that this is uh, an area that can revolutionize many things. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's the only way of solving problems. All right. Uh, but I think that there are a lot of potential opportunities. Now, to answer the question where companies are happy to go for this, well, um, I'm aware of um, a, an actual, uh, actual companies that are providing these services. There are not that many in the world, actually, as a matter of fact. Uh, it's very interesting. There are some trials around the world that are trying to, to do this. Uh, they have also done this a little bit in other type of network businesses, such like, as in gas systems. Of course, it's not voltages, it's other stuff, <laughs> right? Uh, but uh, what I think is the, the, the more intelligent, no, I wouldn't say more intelligent, the more um, 
uh, innovative way of using smart meters uh, will push us to explore these sort of approaches. And Sponsor, if companies, I would say, maybe. Yes, and if companies, distribution companies, do find the value because it's cheaper than actually modeling the networks or it's faster, if they do find the value, they will apply. Uh, that does not mean that they don't need to continue their efforts in having the full models because they need also to do that. But uh, but this is an opportunity that is quite interesting. That's what I would say. Yes, I agree. I think everything is just getting smarter, and uh, I agree with you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Uh, we have another question here in the chat section. Uh, have you ever evaluated the investment requirement in an actual distribution system? say Melbourne or other places for accommodating the uh, ever increasing PV penetration? And the, how about the impacts for the ever increasing PV penetration on the profit tendency of the concern uh, distribution grid company? All right, the, that's, that's a, those are very interesting questions. This presentation is not about that. Uh, we have a very interesting project, which is a project that I was mentioning from Arena, where we are releasing, hopefully in a few days, a, a, a report about the cost of upgrading uh, the, the networks uh, with different type of solutions. Um, it is it is it's, it's quite tricky. Uh, there's no place in the world, even in Australia, where we can say, oh, solar photovoltaics is costing so much in upgrades. No. No, because we don't have so much photovoltaics. As much as it sounds like a lot, it's not that much, all right? However, we know that we are heading to that point, all right? And then they cannot deal with the problems just with the Volvo settings and the Volvar settings, or just uh, playing with the unload the changers or the offload the changers, uh, or simply telling people not to inject much more than an X number of kilowatts. There's, we're reaching the limits. We're reaching the limits where we really need to start investing properly. So, so far around the world, they have been doing kind of pseudo investments, trying to find solutions that are very, very low cost, quite understandably, of course. Uh, but uh, it is getting to the point that they need to start deciding which solution. The problem is that there are so many solutions that it's difficult for them to really say what is the most cost effective. At the same time, you have the other side of the coin where I guess that the person that wrote this question knows uh, distribution companies around the world are rewarded by putting more copper on the ground. That's how the regulation works around the world. The more copper you put, the more assets, the more you get a return, all right? So therefore, why would they not invest in more copper, you know, more transformers, more conductors? That would be silly. They wouldn't make profit. Now, this is where each country is different because in certain countries, they are incentivizing companies to find different ways of doing things. Uh, so therefore, by incentivizing, I mean, they're actually going to get some profit from doing a smart things. In other parts of the world, there's no incentive to do a smart things. So therefore, the companies are going to put more copper, more transformers. So it depends on the part of the world. Now, associated with the problem that this particular question was also making about the fact that the more that we have to solve photovoltaics, perhaps the, the companies will have less revenue. Now, we need to be careful there. It also, it depends uh, on, on how this is being uh, the tariff of distribution networks are being used. If, of course, it's a tariff that was always designed based on kilowatt hours, yes, we have a problem and the tariff has to be revised. But tariffs have been revised around the world in many places, not everywhere. So therefore, companies that are still not revising their tariff and they think that they need to charge based on kilowatt hours and people are reducing their kilowatt hours because of photovoltaics and batteries, et cetera, of course, they are in problems. But in other parts of the world, they are moving. So it's not just setting in stone how companies are going to get revenue or how they are going to be uh, incentivize. It depends on the regulator of each country, and each country is different. Thank you. Um, another question. Uh, any advice for cases where we don't have enough smart meters installed or not accessing <laughs> installed data, for example, 10 to 20 percent data is accessible? Uh, well, that's an excellent question. I, I, uh, this is a complex one. So for instance, uh, as I was mentioning, this is the case of Victoria, where we can really push the boundaries with the smart meters, right? Um, outside Victoria, we don't have smart meters as much as Victoria, here in Australia, only speaking here in Australia. Uh, that, that's not to say that companies outside Victoria, they are not actually trying to get more data. So for instance, in, depending on the state here uh, outside Victoria, if you install a photovoltaic system, you have to install a meter that is also pretty much a smart meter. Same thing if you install a, a electric vehicle or things like this. So they are creating requirements for them to have more observability. So eventually they are getting this observability, but correct, it is not the same as having smart meters everywhere. So what can be done? I think that there's a point where companies need to understand that this data 
will bring benefits to their business. And uh, if they do understand that, they can make the investment. But of course, it's a very difficult one as well, because if you, you can argue that here in Victoria, it wasn't the companies that made the business case. It was the government that pushed for this. And actually, as a matter of fact, in most countries around the world, are the governments that are pushing for this because the companies are not necessarily take, take, taking the risk. There are a few cases here and there that they took the risk, uh, but in other cases, it is the governments. So it's a little bit political and a little bit difficult to tell. So the advice, I, I, I wouldn't say wait and see, but I would say just fingers crossed and someone will actually realize the benefits of this. Thank you. Um, the second, the, the other question is, uh, why DNN and not be Pan or feed forward in it? Oh, oh, well, then we, this is just the start of the work. Just that. <laughs> That's really <laughs> literally that. We are just starting and it's extremely encouraging, but yeah, we need to explore many, many more other, other types of neural networks. So thanks, thanks for, for pointing that out. Uh, the other question. Uh, so there are two questions here. How did you consider the impact of high voltage network when focusing on the simulation or analysis of the low voltage network? Um, and then the second question is, how did you get the residential demand data from the net, net meter data for residential customers? Okay, so the first question. So um, in the first project, uh, well, the idea was to have a head of the feeder meter and the low voltage. So therefore that, that detaches you from whatever is happening upstream because you have that data, all right? In the third project, we model the whole high voltage network. So we model the whole thing. So all the effects of in the high voltage network because of the other residential parts of what is happening with the unload type changer in the primary substation, the zone substation is discovered here in Victoria at least, uh, they are all captured. Now in the middle project, the one with the neural network, at, that mo at this moment in time, we haven't really captured those, those changes and it is a work in progress. So yes, eventually you need to capture it. And the best way to capture it is by having an integrated high voltage, low voltage model. And from there you get all the corresponding data. Now, um, the question about where we got the data, the P and Q values from this pool of real smart meter data, that, that was part of a project with TOSNET. So thanks, thanks TOSNET for, for sharing data as well. Oh, thank you. And another question is, can we use the obtained data for by a smart meter to have more efficient control strategy for PV inverters to improve voltage quality? Well, absolutely. I mean, the, so the, 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 the projects I have presented here, the ideas uh, are, are just really for voltage calculations. But the moment that you know the voltage calculation, you can actually decide, okay, what if I tune certain operating uh, settings of certain elements and see how these affect voltages. And then you can actually kind of go in circles, you know, in a iterative process to find what is the best sort of operation uh, for these photovoltaic inverters. Uh, we have done that analysis, but with model uh, based approaches. Uh, actually, in that project, you will find a lot of information in that arena project. So I encourage you to go there. There are webinars as well. But uh, if it is for, for this uh, smart meter only data, then you will require, you know, to do a little bit of modeling as well, I guess. But it is possible because if you can extract the voltage effects, then you can actually see what certain operations can actually do with respect to voltages. So I think that there, it is, there's, there are some possibilities there. Thank you. Okay, is there any other question? Uh, if there is uh, no question, let me just jump here. And first, uh, I thank you for the very interesting and informative uh, and excellent presentation. That was fantastic. And, I really enjoyed you, your bringing this very up-to-date uh, and very new uh, outcomes of the research and sharing it with us uh, before the audience of the other conference. So that's fantastic, thanks. Uh, I, I, I have also, also one question about like generally this uh, deep uh, neural network technique that you said you're using and you were considering the active and reactive power as the input and trying to calculate the voltage in the, as the output of the system. And you mentioned that there is a, like a very huge amount of data of five years of uh, available data coming from smart meters that was used for that. Uh, my, my question is mainly about this uh, validity of this model that is made by this deep neural network, considering that as the time is going on, we have more and more customers that uh, their nature of demand is slightly changing. Some of them, for example, we had at one place, a house with one, a land with one house over like one or two years, they might change it to like one house, one land with uh, five, 10 houses. Uh, even some of them may not had photovoltaic systems a few years back, now they have added. So there is, seems that there is this continuous uh, change in the uh, 
uh, in the demand. So uh, what I feel is that continuously this network, uh, uh, that modeling has to be continuously up, up being upgraded. Absolutely uh, right, uh, Farhan. Thanks for the question. Yes, exactly like an electrical model. The electrical model has to be updated every six months, every three months, as soon as you have any change in the network. Topological change or new customers, as you mentioned. So same thing will have to be applied for the neural networks. The moment that you know that your topology has changed, your network has changed, you need to run the whole thing again, which in practice, it means every month you have to do it. Now, if your topology, your network doesn't change, your impedances, your connectivity is all the same, meaning the street hasn't changed, there's no new houses, <laughs> all right? Uh, then changes in photovoltaics or demand, it doesn't affect the physics of the network because the physics are the same. They depend on the connectivity and impedances. If that doesn't change, it doesn't matter what is the demand or what is the generation. The neural network will capture it. Of course, it will get refined the more data that you have, definitely. But there are two things that are separate. One is your network doesn't change, only demand and generation. Will the neural network be affected? Not so much. Your network does change. Will your neural network be affected? Definitely, as affected as any electrical model. So yes, you need to do this uh, in cycles. Um, what is the cycle? How frequently? As frequent as you notice changes in your network, for sure. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. I agree, definitely. Thank you. Uh, there is one more question, if I may ask. Uh, is there any specific requirement for installed smart meter in the network, for example, 50% or 80% for achieving model free assessment? Uh, the model free. Um, now, this is the model free of the neural network, which is the new model free of the hosting capacity. I mean, let, let me answer for both. So, um, no, okay, so install meter in the network. Okay, now I understand your question. Um, yes, everything has to be with the smart meters. So everything that I presented with the smart meters means every single customer has a smart meter, all right? And, and this is uh, per se not a challenge for Victoria because all the customers have the smart meters. The challenge is more practical because as much as you can have all residential customers with the smart meters and also the commercial industrial customers with smart meters, remember in a low voltage network, it's not just houses. You can have a shop, okay, a coffee shop. You can have a, I don't know, sometimes a little, uh, I don't know, office or whatever it is. So uh, the problem that we have in, in Victoria, at least, well, I'm, I'm aware from Osnet, I don't know how it works with other companies, is that the data that they manage in terms of the smart meter is really the residential one, the commercial and industrial customer, because they are uh, able to select their provider of smart meters, they can actually have other company managing the data. So for operational purposes, managing the data is not as simple as within the same company. So it requires buying the data, for instance, but that is, is possible nonetheless. For operational purposes, however, that's another story because buying the data from being historical, you can do this, they, they can do that. But using the data for operational purposes, meaning I want to do the calculations now in five minutes based on the smart meter data, then that's another challenge because you don't manage those databases. So there are some practical challenges still. But bottom line, to answer that particular question, every single customer has a smart meter in all these projects that I mentioned, which is the case of Victoria. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I don't think there is any other question. Uh, if there is not, uh, I, oh yeah, there is another, I, sorry. Uh, seems it's uh, just a thank you. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, uh, well, well, of course, there were so many thank yous and excellent and nice presentations, which uh, were in the comments, but Sarah was only reading yes, sorry. the <laughs> questions. <laughs> so, uh, one question I had is about this generally, uh, building that large uh, data uh, base that for, for that data that is coming from the smart meters, you mentioned some numbers, for example, you said five year data, one million points, and of course, considering lots of different electrical parameters there. Um, and considering that that becomes like for a network with lots of feeders and lots of customers, so it becomes a very significant amount of database. Uh, I was uh, very indirectly involved with a similar project here with our utility company that they were doing, but very on a very limited number of uh, points they had this data measurements and eventually we ended up with a very significant database that making that managing that and being able to retrieve data from that was also a significant part of the work so uh, I, I feel that i mean how was your experience i mean uh, did you have this type of uh, uh 
not really electrical engineer challenges, but more IT and computer side of the challenges in order to uh, build that big database uh, or access that, retrieve any information. That so when, when I presented that the slides of the one, let, let me go back to that slide. Uh, all right. Uh, that's, oh, sorry, went too far. Um, da, 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 da. The, the, that's that's the slide I would mention about. Uh, so initially we got actual data from all these more than 3000 customers for one day, but it was so painful to extract this data. <laughs> Not exactly, that, exactly. For, for, for the guys of Osnet, you were doing a great job by the way, but they, it, it, it was so demanding, you know, in terms of resources to extract this data, to be sure that it is uh, processed correctly, that it's anonymized that we realized that doing this, this was one day and it took a lot of effort. So doing this for one year, that at least we needed one year to see the, the evolution of the penetrations, we decided, no, we need to create our own data. And, and then this is where we actually created our own data by eventually you know, uh, having different penetrations of tall dikes, running the power flows, et cetera, et cetera. However, saying 1 billion data points, it doesn't, it's not that much. Uh, I mean, three gigabytes of data, is it really that much? I mean, when, when, when you download the stuff, you know, when you watch YouTube, you know, suddenly it goes one gigabyte. So it's really, it's really not that, that much, you know, to process. Uh, but really, when, if, if, if this was real data, let's put it like this, it's, it's not the volume of data that is a, co a complexity, it's really, making sure that uh, everything stays uh, anonymous, that you have the corresponding support from the company to move the data to another party. And that can be very challenging, but it's not impossible, of course, you know, depending on the collaborative approach of each company with the universities or the research organizations. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, definitely. Thank you, thanks. All right, thank you very much, Professor Nando, for your uh, great contribution, for your great presentation. It was really interesting and up to date, of course, very um, new research and we really enjoyed. I think audience, uh, they, they actually put lots of comments and mentioned they really uh, enjoyed your presentation. I, sorry, I didn't actually read through all the comments. I just um, read, oh, read the questions only. Um, That's fine. Yeah. Well, I mean, thank you very much for the invitation. I hope you all enjoyed. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So again, uh, I, I, I have to thank on behalf of myself and the entire organizing committee of the conference for your great support and contribution to us. Uh, it was very uh, great and lovely to have you with us. And we, uh, I myself enjoyed and I'm pretty sure from the question and answer, it's obvious that everybody was, uh, your, your presentation was very interactive, very interesting and everybody enjoyed that. Thank you very much for your great support for us. Thank you. I enjoyed the rest of the conference. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Have a good time for you as well. Bye-bye. Thanks, bye. Okay, everyone, I will see you in, I think, 20 minutes uh, with our third uh, keynote speaker. Thank you. Bye.